orthopedic networking, e-learning, education, and research that was designed to fill the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one, one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SickOps Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe. With over 55,000 views of our webinars so far, we're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Right, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Vikas Kanduja, consultant orthopedic surgeon in Cambridge, UK, and one of the founders of SICOT Pioneer. And it is indeed a pleasure to welcome all, all of you logging into this webinar from all around the world. Now, in the COVID world of non-contact domains, we've certainly embraced digital competitiveness with the launch of SICOT Pioneer. And through this platform, we've been able to do over 40 events and have had over 60,000 views from 110 countries. So a big thank you for joining us and following us. Now, today's webinar is the third in the series of research, and we're greatly indebted to Professor Mo Bandari, who leads our research academy, and Mr. AJ Malvia, who've done a stellar job in putting this together. We're also very thankful to a fantastic faculty who've given up their time to join us for this webinar, and I'll let Mo and AJ introduce you to them in a minute. We'll try and make this as interactive as possible, so please do post in your questions uh, on the chat box, and we'll try and answer them as we go along. If you can't join us today for any reason, then we do have the option of on-demand viewing, which you can view the webinar later on. So once again, a big thank you for joining us, and I'll hand it over to Adrian Mo to kick off the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vikas, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us. So as Vikas has already mentioned, this is the third of the series of webinars that we have uh, planned, that the research, uh, and, uh, research Education and Mentorship Committee has planned for all of you. And this uh, uh, today, we will concentrate on collaboration and research and ethical consideration. So a warm welcome uh, to uh, my moderator, co-moderator Mohit Pandari from Canada, who actually does not need any introduction. He's the face of orthopedic research all across uh, the world. He has thousands of publications and an extensive experience in uh, research, and uh, he's uh, the chair of our research academy. I would also like to thank our faculty, who I will introduce through the course of uh, the event. But as you can see, there's a combination of uh, clinical researchers of very high pedigree and research managers who've got extensive experience in delivering research at grassroots level. So hopefully this would be beneficial to all of you. A special thanks goes to all the, uh, the members of the Research Education Mentorship Committee who've given up their time in uh, 
producing uh, this program, which will culminate in a full day of uh, uh, research education in uh, Kuala Lumpur. So many thanks, Naritan from Albania, Tom Hilton from South Africa, Aju Bosco from India, Shashi from Oman, and Steve Chung from Hong Kong. So uh, this is uh, sort of uh, the program for uh, the uh, webinar today. But uh, from the feedback that we've received uh, over the last uh, few weeks, we've tried to change how we are going to deliver it. So it's going to be a combination of uh, presentation and panel discussion. We want to reduce the time spent uh, on presentations so that there could be a greater discussion time. So before introducing my first speaker for the day, I would like uh, Professor Bhandari to say a few words about uh, the session today. Sure. Uh, again, thanks, Ajay. Thanks, Vikas. Um, as you can imagine, you know, CCOT, uh is in has, with many other organizations, been in challenging times. And you know, when we think about a global organization, we think about how we can connect on commonalities. And I think all of us believe that we have meaningful ways in which we can share information and information in the way of data. What this session I think is particularly important for those of us who are interested in collecting data is to understand that data collection comes with a sense of responsibility of morals and ethics. Data collection also comes with responsibility of good clinical practice. We hear that term lots, but we often don't really understand what it means to be an appropriate um, servant of data. And I think today uh, we're going to hear lots about that in our uh, quest to you know, move research forward as a global collaborative. We also have uh, you know, a great luxury, and I think you've heard lots, of also hearing from experts on the topics of you know, how, do we, how do we do research in a, in, in, uh, in a, in a multicultural environment and, and a multinational environment, right? Um, so we'll learn a little bit about that, and we'll certainly learn a lot more uh, about uh, understanding collaboration with the big C uh, version of collaboration, which is often within your institution, but also globally. So lots and lots of uh, interesting, I think, discussions ahead. Today will be very conversational, I hope, uh, and we'll just have a wonderful discussion, I think, with some um, pretty amazing panelists. So I'm looking forward to it, Ajay. Thank you very much. So, uh, Peter, would you mind sharing your screen, actually, because I think you have got a presentation. So, Peter, is, uh, uh, she wants to me to introduce herself as an amazing, happy and helpful person, which she indeed is. But uh, she also is uh, the director of innovation and research in uh, Northumbria. She has a 35 year history of working in clinical research in various specialties. And uh, she's the perfect person to actually introduce this particular topic to us, clinical research. How do you make the journey through research to patient benefit and practice change? Peter. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much for inviting me to um, present today and also to be the first up and the one that's going to stumble around getting the screen shared. <laughs> Things not working so well. So screen sharing, yeah. That one? Do I click it? Is that okay? Can you oh no, what's this? Can you see it? No? You, yeah, you've I done it. Fantastic. Got it. Okay, right. Well, I'm going to not quite look at you because the screen's over here now then. So it's a really, really broad topic, um, how to make the journey through research, patient benefit and practice change. But I'm going to truncate it down and just give you a flavour that I think might actually be reflective globally, because obviously we're very indoctrinated into UK practices. So it's a big question, but we'll see how I can get this right. Can I close that? Down? How do I get that? Down? There we go. So the second screen up now, yeah? Do patients benefit from research? So best patient care is based on the best clinical evidence. I'm making the assumption that everybody here is very new to research or um, can learn from some of these pathways. Um, I think that we have to consider that patients value the opportunity to participate in research. Um, also that like, um, Research active institutions have much better health outcomes, regardless of whether that patient is actually a participant in the research. Um, I think that might actually be benefited by the fact that research active organisations attract high achieving professionals from around the um, regions or other countries. Um, research also promotes critical thinking and reflective practice. And all patients have the right to be involved in research. And I think sometimes as a care and clinician, you are the gatekeeper to that 
research um, opportunity. So if you aren't research active, then maybe you don't actually think research. So you have to actually broaden your perspective and say every person has the right to participate in research, regardless if you are the researcher or not. Um, we find that a lot in practice that if they aren't actually the researcher, then that patient, if under that pair, doesn't get that opportunity, which is a shame. Moving on um, towards practice change and what part does research play in that? So the evidence provides the confidence and validations for changes in practice, and it also should underpin changes in practice. Research is often the route to making a difference in changes in lifestyle and healthcare. And good research can enhance policy decisions on how we deliver treatments and services. It's very difficult to actually make changes in practice without having it underpinned by research and good scientific and quality research. I think very briefly looking at can orthopaedic trials change practice? Yes, they can. There was um, a, a large clinical trial in orthopaedic, well, large clinical trials in orthopaedics are worthwhile endeavours. And if the evidence is compelling, all you surgeons will actually be um, reactive to those changes. There's a reference in there. But I suppose the main question I was asked to answer is, how do you make this journey and what do you need? It's a very basic checklist, but it, there's a lot of um, elements within each part. So first off, you need an idea and motivation. Motivation is very different. Sometimes it is for qualification. Sometimes it's for patient benefit. Sometimes it's for interest. It doesn't really matter, but you do need an idea and you need the motivation. Without the motivation, you will not fulfill the research because it is very difficult to keep momentum going. You need the population because sometimes a very broad idea, you don't actually have the population in your own clinical practice areas. You need to understand what's actually already been done and rather than repeat it, maybe enhance on it or choose a different model or even refute it. Um, you do need funding. There is no such thing as free research or no cost research. A lot of people suggest, well, it won't cost anything but time, but time is money. And you, even if these are paper, you need to consider funding your research. You need approvals from both your organisation, clinical leads and regulatory approvals. Now, they will vary across different countries. Gemma will touch on that a little bit, but you do need those approvals. What we find a lot of the time is people have an idea, they begin their research journey and they don't actually realise that there's a lot of approvals to get. And then when they try to publish it or share that information, they are actually struggling to do that and you can't get retrospective approvals. Um, you definitely need to consider the workforce and the support services that you need and any other research resources that you might need. But most importantly, wherever you are, you need your R&D, which is your research team to support you because we have that expertise in the research, you have the expertise in speciality, but we can take a lot of that pain away. So that is my six minutes of whistle-stop for a great big long journey, but very happy to um, sit and have questions throughout or uh, now I'm not quite sure of the forum. So back to you, AJ. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, Mo, do you want to say a few words before we go on to Gemma's uh, probably quick presentation as well? No, I, I wonder if we just kind of uh, get through the presentation and we can just work with a discussion there after a conversation. Brilliant. Gemma, it's your turn then. So Gemma uh, is a pharmacologist by background. She's got 12 years of uh, um, experience in healthcare research. She is very experienced in governance, finance, and regulatory obligations of research. She runs uh, GCP courses. So the perfect person to enlighten us as to what uh, the current GCP guidelines are. And, uh, Gemma, thank you. Yeah, um, I'll just try and follow Peter's thing. Double click and share this appropriately. Hi, can everyone see the slides? Hi, so thanks very much for coming along today. And there's GCP is a massive question, so I'm never going to be able to, in three or four minutes, give you a complete understanding of, G of good clinical practice. But I'm hoping today that I'll cover a few details that I'll bet you realise that actually you are doing this already in your day to day practice. You just didn't realise it was. Good clinical practice is the title that it is. I'm hoping that I'll be able to give you a little bit of confidence in um, understanding the GCP within your standard of practice. I do promise you, though, that GCP or good clinical practice is no different than the standard of care practice that you already provide. And some of the parts that I'll cover is about patients at the centre of it and about protecting them and yourselves. 
So good clinical practice is an ethical, scientific and practical regulatory standard guideline that has been put in place by the ICH um, International Council for Harmonisation and also by WHO, our World Health Organisation, to help all people supporting the conduct of all clinical trials. This is not just about our drug trials, this is about all research that we do with our patients to deliver what we would call high quality data. This guideline is worldwide recognised and allows the spread of new healthcare advantages for patients around the globe. Research was not always as well structured as we experience these days um, with these set recognised standards and from some ethical research many, many years ago, which failed to protect patients, allow voluntary consent and keep the participants safe, the GCP guidelines was developed. So that is the primary principle of what we're doing. It's about protecting the right safety, dignity and well-being of our participants who participate in our research. The standard was underpinned um, by high quality research and includes the principles and responsibilities. The framework of this principle is to ensure the right safety of the researchers as well. Um, and this is about protecting yourselves. If you follow this guidance and these guidelines, you are protected along with your participants. But it's also about providing integrity and validity of the data. Credible data is exactly what our sponsors and our organisations come to you for. And that doesn't matter where you are in the, in the world or in the country. That is what we're looking for. Without the data, we are unable to answer our research question. And without being able to answer the research question, we can't determine whether that new treatment or that intervention we're looking for is the, the right one to go forward with or is the best way for our patients. High quality data is, a sense, is essential for the usability of our clinical research and the safety of our new interventions. Because ultimately, we don't want to put a new drug on this into standard care that is not safe for our population or our patients. Now, GCP is a, is a vast um, area of regulation. It has 14 different elements. And that elements and those regulations do vary country to country in some interpretations. The, as Peter touched on before about the regulations, now the regulatory approvals that you will require in your organisations in your countries is slightly different. But what I've hoped to do is focus a couple of minutes on the areas that are important across organisations and across our countries that are in most in research. So when we think about those main points um, that we should take away, to, that I hope that I'm going to ask you to take away today, is informed consent is a must. It is really, really important when we're asking participants to take part in our research in that we have their consent and their willingness to participate in our research. Safety management is non-negotiable. We need to understand that the benefit of a new practice outweighs the risks and the side effects to our population and our patients. Because at the end of the day, if it's not safe for them, they're not going to take that new intervention or that new drug. We have to ensure that the quality source documentations must be generated and available. This means you must have this document information as you would clinically do in your hospital and have it available to confirm the data that you provided for the study. So we're asking that it's not about how that is collected or where, because every place differs. It's about that it is available and that it's there and that we can use it to confirm the data that you've collected. Administration and control of the investigational product is paramount to confirm the efficiency, as well as the safety to support the study's claims and its future application to become standard of care. Protocol compliance is expected and is a must. The protocol is what they are hoping to maintain this, the, the study in each centre. So as we do worldwide research, we want every centre to do research in the same way for that protocol to make sure that we are approving and we're looking at the research correctly and that the data is truly comparable. So it's really, really important that you follow that protocol and that study as much as possible. And that's what we hope to share with you when we do our good clinical practice. So that's just a couple of important focus points that I wanted to kind of reference and main that I hope is transferable across countries and across our worldwide organisation. Um, and then it was just open for questions from there or at the end of the presentation. Thanks, uh, Gemma. So you can probably stop sharing your screen. So uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Reed uh, to say a few words about uh, the topic allocated to him, research collaboratives and how to make them work. And uh, Mike, he is an esteemed colleague, one of the most prolific researchers in the UK, one of the most respected ones, and not just because of his research uh, uh, throughput, it's also because he's done a lot for uh, orthopedic training. And uh, in recent times, he's been involved in a lot of quality improvement initiatives. 
and uh, that has required collaborative approach. So, Mike, would you like to share with us uh, a few things in terms of collaborative work that you've uh, done over the last few years? Um, AJ, thanks, thanks very much for that uh, introduction. I don't, I'm not sure I deserve that, but uh, as you as you point out, my my non clinical time is pretty much split between improvement and uh, and research, and um, it they they are in a way quite great and quite similar because you need if if all the tactics that you're introducing with quality improvement you really need to introduce with research if it's going to be collaborative because it's all about bringing people on board uh, it's really this the same skills i feel um now i think the reason that 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 you asked me to to get involved in this talk was because we ran a couple of years ago at a large collaborative um called the quality improvement the surgical teams collaborative which was um which was asking a, a a very simple research question which was could we use the institute for healthcare improvements um breakthrough series collaboratives uh, to introduce proven interventions into the nhs so in this context it was the the hospital trusts that were the subjects rather than the rather than the patients if you like that were uh, that sat beneath that so we we took two proven interventions, one being screening for um, MSSA, um, which I know you're an expert on, and um, the uh, so that was essentially screening and decolonizing for methicillin sensitive Staph aureus to try and reduce infections after joint replacement, and the second proven intervention that we wanted to see if we could introduce was. Uh, anemia screening preoperatively. So this is testing people um, for anemia before they have their hip or knee replacement and then correcting that to improve outcomes. Um, but the, the research question really was, could we use the Institute for Health, Healthcare Improvements um, protocol to do that? Um, now, the, the slide I've, I've chosen today is, um, is simply the... Um, is, is an improvement slide. And I've done that deliberately. I know this is uh, a research talk. Um, now, can you see that slide that's there? Can you see that, AJ? Yes. Okay, first. So, so this is a, a, a slide which is directed at quality improvement, but I think it's so similar to collaborative research that I use the same um, lessons, if you like, when I'm trying to set up a collaborative project. Um, so firstly, it's convincing people that there's a problem. So with collaborative research, you need to convince all of the people that you're collaborating with that, that actually it's a problem worth solving. Um, and I think uh, that's actually quite difficult. Sometimes research projects come out and you wonder quite why they got funded. Um, and I'm sure people think the same thing about my trials. So um, trying to get a shared research question, I think, is is something that can be quite tricky. Um, you need to convince people that you can get the funding. Um, you need to, so, you know, if you join together, will it work? Um, then there's all the data monitoring and uh, collection to agree, which I think can be difficult. Uh, inevitably, there will be a leader in this collaborative research. And I think that's fine, um, but it's probably up to um, the, the leader to uh, to support other people in the group. So what it mustn't be like is that you've got one leader telling everyone what to do, um, because that that really isn't collaborative, and that this looks like a very traditional picture. Um, so I think it's suited to um, suited to very sort of open individuals who are collaborative in nature and share things. And, um, you know, I, I know, I know Mo Vandari is, um, is, is, is really into this. And I've listened to one of the podcasts he did, which, which just, um, it, it just shows you how, it, you know, collaborating can make you grow. And I think it's a risk you have to take. Um, and I, I think we could talk a little bit about that. So um, the, one of the issues is around organizational context. Uh, now, that's a complicated way of saying that each healthcare organization has its own problems. 
and it's you need to design a study which can be introduced into any healthcare setting or at least any healthcare setting that you're trying to study. So it's got to be very, very pragmatic. And um, obviously, pragmatic trials are excellent, but then they they do sometimes water down the research question. So it's getting the balance between what's achievable and what gives you a really good, useful answer. Leadership, I've, I've touched on, but I think it needs to be uh, essentially someone that can do the work, but also someone that ideally will allow ideas from other places so that people feel genuinely involved. Um, incentivizing, well, I, th I think the great advantage that we've had recently um, is, is a lot of the journals now obviously are allowing multiple authors, um, which I think does help getting engagement from from centers and, and you know, frankly, very large numbers of people. But, um, you know, a lot of a lot of this is done on enthusiasm. Peter's completely right about the fact that time is money, but inevitably that there are there are large numbers of people doing small numbers of small amounts of work who are not getting paid for research. And so if we can incentivize them with authorship and things, I think that's really helpful. Um, and then securing sustainability really is about improvement rather than research. So I'll, I'll miss that out. And then um, the side effects of change. I mean, this is really in, in a research context. This is about what risks people are willing to take in terms of outcomes. Um, you, you know, we, it's, it's always a problem if you're doing something which you think might harm patients. You know, these the, the trials that have been done of conservative versus surgical treatments, for instance, really ambitious. People must lose sleep when they're doing that sort of research. Um, and I think I think trying to get that done collaboratively is tricky. And the, and the people that have done that are just amazing individuals, as far as I'm concerned, trying to get everybody in line. So I think that's um, that's all I had to say in my slides. I'm obviously very happy to take any questions when we get to that. Thank you very much, Mike. So um, next, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Johari uh, to say a few words about ethics of research and the views from developing world. Now, Prof. Johari is uh, probably again a man who does not need any introduction. He's the president of uh, SACORT, which is uh, a great honor, uh, honorable position to be in. He is an esteemed pediatric orthopedic surgeon from India. He's been the president of Indian Orthopedic Association, and uh, hopefully he'll enlighten us as to uh, how the developing world can conduct uh, research and how they can be involved in collaboratives. Professor. Thank you, Ajay. And um, the developing world is a different environment altogether. There are problems with funding. There are problems with regulation of research. There are problems um, where actually ethics come into play, you know, for example, consent, informed consent, what happens when there's a problem or when there's an adverse event or a serious adverse event and how do you compensate uh, for the ill effects of research. So these are all problems on the developing world side, you know. Economics is definitely a problem, you know, it's a big problem because uh, if you don't have money, how do you do research? You know? So money is required for research, obviously to have a team which can work consistently together. You know, you require lots of people, like you need your research managers, of course, you need your principal investigators, you need other people, you know, who will do the documentation, who will do the informed consent process, et cetera, you know, so a big setup and a team is required, you know, and all that demands money, you know, so that's, that's one aspect of it, you know. The second aspect is, of course, regulation of research. And um, there are a lot of regulatory rules in place uh, all around the world and as well for India. There's a lot of regulation which does happen, you know, but actually the conduct of research, you know, how it takes place. I mean, auditing and quality control and risk management really are not issues, you know, not serious issues are not taken seriously you know so these are the areas where there are deficits in actually conducting research you know and then proper documentation proper analysis of results and uh, publications you know arising out of these research also are problems you know so the developing world is trying to grapple with these problems 
largely i think uh, the interest of um, the research subjects or the patients who are involved in research well has not been given the due consideration that it deserves good clinical practices are there of course uh, the problem is with the heterogeneity of the country you know so you have a large country like india and there are some ethics committees which are very good there are some ethics committees uh, which are not standard you know so how do you enforce that throughout the uh, range of the country and throughout the length and breadth of the country you know th- this is a problem you know so there are many problems facing us in developing countries and i thought i would highlight uh, some of these uh, you said it would be a panel discussion so i thought i'd bring up these points in a panel discussion but in a nutshell i think these are some of the problems we are facing you know. thank you very much mo you know i think um why don't we just just kind of start off and and maybe i'll begin with you um ashok just to begin uh and ajay i'm sure you'll have lots of questions as well so please feel free to ask some here um this is an open discussion so you know we are all part of this so if anyone else has a question or a, you know, a clarifying comment for another panelist please do ask but let me begin with you ashok i think you begin with a very um it's a critically important issue right which is um you talk about money and then we also talk about sort of the need for you know having trained expertise in these areas this happens not just in developing nations but it happens all, all in our own institution in canada we have a paucity of individuals in this particular case uh, surgical trainees and surgeons wanting to take on surgeon scientist careers and one of the biggest challenges they always tell us is you know i need resource i need protected time and for protected time i need to have funding and salary support for that so and then the, the challenge is that it's hard to get protected time without having some demonstrated ability to have done the research so it's this kind of circular argument that we get into from your perspective and maybe you can speak a little bit a show to your experience and all your leadership roles i mean how do we get more surgeons taking research and science much more seriously than they are um and what are the i guess success stories that you've heard about yeah thanks mohit i i think the priorities of surgeons especially in the developing countries are very very different you know it's uh, clinical work of course and to earn a good remuneration for what they are doing research is something which is not promoted and uh, which is not incentivized uh, in a correct way uh, the surgeon feels that if i do research you know i lose time from clinical practice and if i lose time from clinical practice i lose money you know and how can i survive you know i'm struggling to make ends meet you know especially with the younger surgeons you know this is a issue you know so the problem is how do you incentivize research and how do you create an aptitude for research in the young surgeons uh, as such uh, in my own sort of uh, interaction with the younger people you know i find very few people interested in academics and research most of them are interested in learning surgery in learning the technical skills and going about and doing surgery you know so it's really a big gap here you know how how do you actually bridge that gap you know so maybe the medical council of india now has made research compulsory you know for promotions and uh, for uh, enhancement of your position from an assistant professor to associate or a professor you do require research to be done some part of it has to be basic research um, so that's that's important you know but um, i agree with you it's a difficult situation you know and uh, having mentors i think the the other big issue with research in developing countries the lack of exposure to it you know because most of our mentors have been clinicians how do you break that mold you know how do you get out of that mold to promote research you know and we are sort of uh, the middle order our predecessors were um, clinicians we are a mix of clinician and research and trying to do research but not getting a um, lot of traction out of it because different reasons we don't know how to do research for example you know we're learning more and more and it's more on a uh, sort of a learning basis uh, it's something we learn as we go on with experience you know so we don't have an environment uh, we don't have an awareness and we don't have 
something which will help us to learn research you know that's one of the big drawbacks in developing countries you know so something like this webinar for example or something like research courses they are getting better now the awareness is better but still we are far away from the way it should percolate actually to the young surgeons you know? we are far away from that so so mike maybe i can get your take on this you know it seems to be that there is a clear challenge with research mentorship and mentorship from your experience can you speak a little bit to about you know the challenges of of surgeon scientists or just you know scientists related careers because and the issue of how important mentorship could be in that role yes i mean i think i think maybe in the uk we are a little better served um you know we we do have sort of clinician scientist programs formally built into our training schemes and um i would guess that that probably is about 5% of our trainees are in that formal program and then we have probably another 5 or 10% who are encouraged to to come out of their training program again into a formal position to do research but that that then they do have to get funded and that and you know that that obviously is a a massive issue for some people so um i mean i think it's it is tricky uh, we don't seem to have a particular shortage in the uk it is my impression um and and certainly we've got a number of academic trainees that come around our our program in the northeast um but in the longer term it is much more problematic and i think i think the same problem that ashok pointed out about the money is a reality um because there's no question that i could earn more by knocking in joints all day um but i suppose hopefully there's a certain certain personality types that that actually get value out of out of adding value and i think that's that's what we need to nurture maybe more than just providing the money i think in the us research in the senior position you know um as as a attending physician is is paid for you know and is valued and i know that you know the us academic scientists um so a clinician scientist salaries are are very significant and and equal to their colleagues so whether we get to that point in the uk i don't know um but uh, that that certainly um would help so it's a bit about culture it's a bit about money i think Yeah, I think that that's that's, that's a great uh, great uh, contributing point. So, Gemma, the the challenge I think that we see um and and certainly Gemma Peter both of you feel free to feel free to to uh, respond to this question, but if we have a situation in developing nations where you know there isn't a lot of of a research culture, there's an interest, we have lots of data, let's say, um you know as Ashok has mentioned, but we don't necessarily um you know have all of the uh you know tradition history and skills going with it when you talk uh, about patient safety in in research in areas where there may not be the same level of experience what are some of the common challenges around gcp or like let's say, let's say uh common um infractions that we have to watch out for you talked a lot about patient consent being really important and also ensuring that we have source data for what we're putting into our data forms Can you speak a little bit to some of the uh challenges for centers that don't have necessarily a, you know a profound history of research and where they're likely to have some roadblocks you know to the rest of us so we can be aware of them? Hi, um brilliant question. I suppose um it depends on the area. So we we are really fortunate here with the amateur bay and we get a lot of information from them. around kind of regular findings across organizations now informed consent is one of those areas in that we don't take the right consent or at the right point so before you do anything to do with research you should consent your patient so that's one of the big big things to make sure you do is you take a consent first before you take bloods before you do anything else the other thing is about oversight so you will appreciate and i imagine everyone will when you decide to take part in research and you put your consultant name down on that paperwork you are taking responsibility now often we see fallings where it's about lack of oversight or they'll say well that clinician that was taking charge of that study at your site do they know everything so communication becomes quite a really important part of research 
And a lot of the forums and a lot of what we've talked about around safety and I've talked about data is about communication and making sure that information is available and people are aware of what's happening. Um, so it's really, really important that when you decide to take on a trial, that you understand who your players are in that study, who is supporting your trial, who is working on that trial and exactly how you're communicating. So when we look at safety, we look at identifying kind of complications. So that comes to how is your patients going to communicate that with you and who to. So if they suffer a symptom at home, so they, they've been involved in a trial and they've gone home and they've had a rash or anything like that, how are they telling you? How are they getting that information back? How are you finding that out? So it's really important to kind of understand how it works in your organisation. Not every country can do it the same way and we'll feed that information back. But it is only about what you know. So when we talk about getting to know safety information, you can't know everything. You rely so much on your patient telling you what's going on. And if they don't tell you, then that we can't do anything about that. We have to go with, we just have to encourage it. We have to encourage in the best way that that will work, whether that is when they see you in clinic, whether that is via a phone, whether you really have the infrastructure to have any staff in it to support, whether they can phone through to a secretary or to a, if you're really fortunate to a research nurse. But if you haven't, we just have to say we get it when we can. And if we can, and we, we understand that that is the way it goes when we're talking about information like that. I don't know if Peter's got any mention of that. I think just to, to from the very outset, what you have to have is a, is a partnership contract with your patient. They need to fully understand. It's not just about sign on this piece of paper to say you're a participant. They need to fully understand what they're engaging in and what their part is. And that's probably, if you get that model right at the very outset of your first appointment, then you're going to probably do okay. And source documentation in the basic of principle, if it just isn't written down, it didn't happen. And so if you just apply those two principles as a partnership, the patient must know what their part is. And therefore, going forward, you'll probably have a more harmonious research outcome. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, uh, Professor Gordon Guyatt at McMaster, you know, he's been one of the early pioneers for us of evidence-based medicine. You should always say, Evidence-based practice begins and ends with the patient. And we've seen more and more, uh, PETA and Gemma, you know, of patient engagement being at the forefront. It used to be you'd start and design a study, you'd get it funded, and then you would go uh, get your investigators, then you'd approach patients. Uh, and we're being asked by our funding agencies, and I suspect the same is happening in the UK as well. Maybe uh, you or, or Mike, maybe you could speak to this, but we are being asked right up Sorry, front. It's, our fire alarm. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um, uh, we... Yeah, 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 we're being asked basically um, to engage patients at a much earlier process with respect to the idea, the importance of the question. And I wonder, um, I see Mike nodding, I see um, Ashok nodding. Can, can anyone speak a little bit to how important it is to get patients engagement early? And, and this movement, I think, is, uh, is certainly becoming more and more important as we go forward. I mean, it's certainly a question that, that we're asked now, even before we get to the funding um, stage. You know, e even the trials unit, when I go to them with an idea, that they'll be asking for the PPI right at that stage. So, um, and that's months before the funding application goes in. Um, so it's, it, it's definitely a key part of it. And I think rightly so, because, you know, we can easily get sidetracked in our own pet projects. And I guess we have mechanisms now within the UK system where the funding stream follows patient questions based on PPI, um, but inevitably that doesn't work all the time. Great. I don't know, Ashok, if you want to speak a little bit to patient involvement in research. No, no I think it's having the patient's uh, best benefit at heart. You know, It's more a question of, uh, let's say, morals and ethics, you know, rather than regulations. Uh, I mean, as a clinician, you know, I always have that um, sort of an approach to my patient, you know, and our patients have so much confidence in us, largely because um, they're lay people. They don't understand. And if they've developed a rapport with you, you know, they listen to you. I mean, we, of course, uh, inform them of everything. I, this procedure A, procedure B and procedure C. What would be the advantages and disadvantages? It means uh, spending time with them, you know, and... Um, trying to explain all the all the difficulties that they have, you know, the questions they raise. You know. So I, I think that makes a very easy background for enrolling them into research. You know. So there's an interesting question from the audience, actually, very pertinent, I would say. The, 
So how the participants of trial should ideally be paid for participation? You know, compensation, pe compensating patients for research. Well, should it be considered as coercion or compulsion? What are your thoughts? But, right, I, Peter. Okay, okay. So uh, more recently than um, formally, pay payments for patients' participation in research has become a feature, but we don't call it a payment for research. We call it inconvenience fees. And this has to be approved by our ethics committees. So they won't accept, with the exception of early phase trials. So if you've got healthy volunteers in the early phase trials, which generally are students giving up a kidney or whatever they do, they are actually paid for that practice. But in actual fact, when you start talking about phases beyond that, phase two and beyond, it's always referred to as an inconvenience fee. And it's measured on the, the time that it takes for a visit rather than a payment per patient. We've just done a very large vaccine trial for COVID and there was an um, inconvenience fee built into that. So each participant got in the region of £650 per visit for the duration of a year. Now, just because they're very free to express why they're doing the trial, a lot of them said it was for the money only. Um, so I don't. I think that has to be the patient's decision whether they want to do it for the money, whether they want to do it for the treatment. Uh, but that trial, to be fair, was healthy people. It wasn't actually patients. So I think most patients' motivations to take part in the trial is either to please the doctor or to get a health benefit for themselves, and payments probably an added bonus. Vikas, you wanted to ask something. Or no, I, I just wanted to pass a comment on Mo's uh, thing of patients getting involved. And I, I think uh, even at the stage of when you're deciding what questions are relevant, most of the research now that we're doing in the UK, at least, we're going through priority setting partnerships where pretty much patients are being involved to be a part of those partnerships and with the doctors to actually decide on the relevant research questions. And the James Lind Alliance is one of those which is actually funding quite a few of these PSPs in the UK, at least. So that goes a long way in, in getting the patient partnership right from the beginning when you're asking the right questions, which are, which are relevant to them. Mike, you want to say something, isn't it? Well, just, just to really add to what Vikas said there, I mean, I think the, the other thing that we can use patients for is actually deciding the outcomes that we want to measure. So um, Matt Costa's team in, in Warwick and now Oxford did a great piece of work because we all thought that mortality would be the outcome that patients were worried about with hip fracture. It just turned out it wasn't mortality at all. It was quality of life. And um, that to me was like a revelation. And that, but that, that work came from detailed work with patients about what mattered to them. And now as a result of that, that's what, well, probably now 12 trials have been structured on that, um, on that really useful key bit of work. So I think I think we can we can get trial design with patients, but also the, the outcomes that are most important to them as well. Yeah, you know it's funny, Mike. You you say that, and uh, you know, it, it, Gordon Guy used to, in his early editions of the books, you know, him and David Sackett and numerous others would say um, we should be looking for clinically important outcomes when we're designing, you know, research study. But clinically important outcomes was often from the perspective of the physician, the researcher. Um, and so they had a revision of that mindset to say, it's actually it's not clinically important outcomes, it's patient important outcomes. And asking and interacting with the patient uh, and getting in, getting that patient involved much more earlier uh, to understand, you know, for this particular intervention, what matters to you. And I think, you know, some of the work that Matt's done and, and many others have done, I think has helped inform that. And it's absolutely the right way to go. I wonder if I could, I know there's a, a couple more questions here that we want to get to from the audience, but I do have a, a, a question that was struck that in your in your statement, um, Mike, that when you, you presented your, your pathway, the beginning and the end for me was particularly interesting because I've, I've struggled myself, in, um, you know, in the first point and the last point, which is convincing people there's a problem whether it's a panelist or whether it's patients or whether there's, you know, your colleagues to move research forward is often one of the most difficult steps there is um, in moving a project forward. And I wonder if you can speak to any examples and challenges or, or, or tips that you have to help people uh, and those interested in saying, you know, you know, Houston, we have a problem and how do we fix this? You know, and getting people to be, get excited about 
the potential solution? Yeah, so I mean, I think I, th I think that certainly the way it works with my research is the most common thing is I'm trying to avoid some sort of complication and trying to find a way of reducing that for patients. And um, probably the most pa the, the most potent way of doing it, and I probably do it too consistently, is is to actually get get a patient on camera that's had the complication and um, talk through, you know. The, over about a three or four minute um, time scale about about the effect on their life, and um, if I'm lucky, on occasions I've I've actually had patients in the room that would do that, um, and even on one occasion, um, a, a, a daughter talking about her father who died, um, and the, and what their what his loss meant, and actually that is a very very good way of focusing people's mind. Um, and then I think then I think you rely on on national benchmarking data. How common is this problem that I've just told you about um, uh, on a personal basis? How many people is it happening to? So I suppose that's how we do it. And I think, but that that isn't always successful because you'll always get hospitals that say, actually, well, we don't have that problem. Um, and uh, I think. All we can say is, well, you know, I, I appreciate you don't have the problem, but imagine it, if it was even better. Um, so it, it is tricky. And I, I think I'll just jump to the last point in your thing. The last point you say is, well, you know, there's also issues with the side effects of change. And, and, you know, when you start a project, we often think, OK, well, if we prove this is if we prove our hypothesis, this could lead to a big change in the, you know, um, whether it's industry or government agency, they get excited by the potential, they get excited by the prior research, they get cited by your collaborative team that's worldwide and everyone waits and waits. And then suddenly you find out at the end, whether there's going to be change or, or not. Um, and oftentimes when there is something very dramatic, most people aren't prepared for it because they just weren't necessarily ready for what was going to happen. Now, I'll give you a simple example. We did, we're doing some research right now on the accelerated care of hip fractures. So changing practice in the management of hip fractures to be rapid, like it's an emergency. Well, if that study, it's, it's, it's ongoing, uh, it's starting again. And if it demonstrates that rapid treatment of hip fractures leads to mortality benefit, it is going to lead to a structural change, not just for the lives of surgeons who will be operating at all hours of night, but for the whole system. Um, and that's a pretty major change that's going to need a lot of interest, but we just do the study and then hope change will happen. I wonder, I've said a lot there, but I'm sure you're, you're nodding. So you must have thoughts on this. Well, you know, I, I've, I've had thoughts on that about hip attack, um, yeah. which presumably is the study you're talking about. And right. I think, um, you know, we, w when we looked at this, I thought, God, that's massive. That's like this, this, this potentially transformational. And of course, the difficulty then about bringing that into a trust is that even to run the trial, you need to be transformational, um, which is what makes it makes it really tricky to do. Um, but you know, I think that's that's what we need. You know, if, if we're going to make giant leaps, then we've got to do some stuff which takes us out of our comfort zone. Um, and and I think the challenge is, is for people running those trials is to is to get them to work, and that's really really hard. Um, as I'm yeah. sure you've found. Absolutely. No, that's fine. That's great. Um, we have a couple of minutes left here, Ajay. I, I, yeah. I do want to make sure that we address a couple of the audience questions, but I'll let you maybe lead that. Yeah, sure. So one of the tasks of uh, the Research Education Mentorship Committee is to actually help um, uh, mentor researchers. And uh, there is a question from the audience, how research mentorship programs can be developed in third world countries? Uh, Professor Jory, do you want to say something about it? How can we develop it such that it helps third world countries? Mm, yes, I think basic research education, which is lacking, you know, so education is important. Awareness is important. The value of research, um, highlighting the value of research and uh, what changes could we expect after the research is done, you know, so... I, I think the role of mentorship, role of examples, leading by example, for example, I mean, to give you an instance or example, you know, all, all this becomes very important, you know, in um, promoting research in developing countries. So, so what would you want SICOT to be able to do? So SICOT, that's what, you know, research education and awareness. Um, 
highlighting research and maybe helping people you know um do research guiding them through the steps maybe in an open discussion or in an open forum you know as to what difficulties they have you know and maybe you could have such forums throughout the year you know maybe once a month or once in two months you know and people can come up with their problems you know and how those problems can be solved you know. if if they don't get appropriate guidelines from their own mentors you know there should be some sort of organization where they can go and they can have satisfactory answers to their questions you know. mo did you have any thoughts you know it's such a it's uh it's, a, it's super important and i think you know we talked a little bit you know shok started off by saying that it, it, it's a it's a major cultural shift that has to happen um and we're seeing more right we're seeing you know we're seeing attendees to this type of uh, virtual seminar saying we want more i think what we need to do in in the spirit of collaboration in the spirit of multinational organizations like secot is leverage our 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 relevant skill sets you know we have members here across you know in, in multiple nations coming together to do just that to just share ideas so what we need to do is once we get able to travel again is get you know get ourselves to various places um, meet people visit their institutions and share our strengths and collaborate you know the thing that i learned the most is i started my own research career as a collaborator in someone else's a uh, project that collaboration gives you insights it gives you real meaningful understanding of how research is conducted and you uh then you know you work your way off into your own projects and i think that's a really important process is it's the apprenticeship model that i think we often forget we just think that you can go get training get a masters for example and then suddenly you're able to do research it helps you with knowledge but there is the the quote hands on approach that i think many people here are are demonstrating because they've been there and done that and i think we need to share those secot's doing that so i'm quite quite happy and proud to be part of an organization that is international that helps us you know share ideas and would you be able to share what secot is prepared to do in terms of helping researchers get funding to kick start a project I'm sure you've got some uh, ideas about yeah, that. Sure. I mean again it uh, I still always think that uh, it's depending on where you are um you know you're going to have different uh, ability to have access to resources. Secot itself has research grants and pilot grants. It doesn't take a lot to get started. I think we often presume that it's going to take lots and lots of resource but every step every dollar you get is $1 for. Mm-hmm. So you know it's often incremental. You start and then you leverage your $1 to make 2 your $2 to make 4 your 4 to make 8 and i think we have to start somewhere so even small seed funding can be really important if it's used wisely um look for agencies you know all international organizations often have a, a research group and often the easiest thing if you're someone interested in research and you don't have a local supervisor um we are in we're in a global you know uh, village now so look for other individuals that you see at meetings that seem to be successful in research contact them and start to work with them and i suspect you'll have no shortage of opportunities open up when you do that yes vikas you want to say something probably yeah, just, was funding just just a point to highlight you know again uh, the uk example of gcp you could look at it about 5 to 8 years ago when we didn't have the gcp as a mandatory course for all the sprs they were not that research aware It means that during our time when we were registrars we were not that research aware it was only if we were interested we got into it but now you look at all the trainees they are very research aware because the gcp course has been made mandatory by the boa in their training so just to create research awareness first i think a mandatory course in the postgraduate early years of your postgraduate training is probably going to be beneficial and once you've done that then what you're talking about in terms of selecting specific mentors around the world zoom has made that possible now um, then you can build on that but basic awareness i think you need something mandatory right in the early years of your training uh, i'm mindful of time perhaps one final question uh, to uh, probably jemma you know the gcp courses how can we make them available to maybe people from uh, other countries I suppose that's probably a really valid point and now that we're doing a lot of training online and available the GCP that we provide for the NHR in England um is an online tool now so I suppose that's a conversation probably for Skigot to have with the NHR body to, to ask if that can be accessible to researchers of this group in other countries um the principles of it are no different 
um, that some of the content is what I've used to do from there. Um, but I think it's a valid question for us to have, and I can take that back to the NIHR and ask about the access to that. It is an online link that it is it is open to all um, with a login. Thank you. Good to know. Mo, I will let you do the final concluding remarks. Well, I mean, as predicted, I think we had uh, a conversation that took us in many places, but ultimately ends up in the same place, that when we work together, uh, when we share ideas, ultimately great things happen. So thank you all uh, to a wonderful panel. Uh, thank you, Ajay, and certainly thank you, Vikas, for supporting us uh, as we move forward with more uh, research education. Right. Thanks, everyone, once again. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.